Command Console, Extended Controller, Compact Controller, Command Console Pro, Command Console Lite, all the controllers, the ultimate Moto Crane controller. All of this and more explained in excruciating detail in today's video. In 2017, we introduced Moto Crane Classic, our very first, very basic remote arm system, which came with a very basic controller. In 2018, we introduced Moto Crane Ultra, which is our very first fully digital remote arm, which required the development of the extended controller, which is a CAN bus based controller that uses an off the shelf touchscreen interface, which allowed us to develop this very, very quickly, but in the end, it was a bit limiting because we didn't fully own every aspect of designing this controller. Now, when we started development on Radical and Hyper, we knew that we wanted to have more features than what the extended controller could handle. So, we developed the command consoles. And in front of me is the Command Console Pro and the Command Console Lite. In today's video, we're gonna go through the features of both controllers, as well as all of the new features that are available in the new version 1.5 firmware update, including Moto Crane Ultra compatibility. Now, before we dive into the user interface of the command consoles and all the new features, I wanna talk a little bit about the physical characteristics of the two controllers and how it compares to the extended controller. Now, the first obvious main difference is the form of the command console pro when compared to the extended controller. And this is something that we spent a lot of time on to make sure that it felt really comfortable and it was the right size sitting on the lap of an operator inside of a camera car. And you can see the difference in size and how much we've optimized out of the Command Console Pro when you compare it to the extended controller here next to it. Now, going to the back, you'll see that we have another difference, which is a passive V-mount battery plate, which does not provide power to the Command Console, but you can take a V-mount battery, and now you have DTAP power for providing power to any accessories that you have mounted, like a monitor or a wireless receiver. Now comparing the Pro to the light, you don't have that V-mount battery plate on the back, but you still have quarter 20 holes for mounting it to parts of the camera car or wireless receivers to it. The Command Console Lite and Command Console Pro share a lot of the same physical features, specifically an e-stop for arming and disarming the system, knobs for adjusting the speed of both axes, and then a touchscreen display. But the main difference between these two controllers is that the Command Console Lite has one dual axis joystick for controlling both axes on one joystick, and the Command Console Pro has discrete joysticks for controlling swing and lift independently. So the Command Console Lite is great when you're operating in confined spaces, you don't have the room for a larger controller, or you really enjoy operating both axes on one joystick. The Command Console Pro is great when you really want to be able to have single axis moves with no crosstalk between joysticks, and you like to have a little bit more screen size for being able to see everything on the controller. So now that we've talked about the differences between the Command Console Pro, the Command Console Lite, and how they compare to the extended controller, let's actually get into the user interface to see all the cool features it offers. The Command Console has a ton of features, so the first thing that I'm going to do is walk through the general layout of the interface so you know where to find different pieces of information. The very top of the user interface we call the header, and that has my e-stop indicator, and underneath it, because I'm connected to a UPC, is my energy stored within the UPC, and I'm going to talk more about that later. And then at the top right, I have my battery voltage monitoring and underneath it is the total current being drawn by the system. Right now I'm not moving anything so it's currently showing zero but if I release e-stop you can see a little bit of current being drawn by the system. Now when I have the e-stop engaged that means that the system is safe meaning that if I move the joysticks nothing is actually going to happen on the arm so it's safe to work around. So anytime that I'm not actively at the command console moving the arm I always have that e-stop engaged for safety. Now directly under the header we call this area right here the dashboard. And the dashboard has position gauges for both lift and swing axis. And it also has a numerical readout of the position of those axes as well. And above the gauges, we have an indication whether or not limits are on or off for both of the axes. And then underneath the gauges, you can see what my speed is currently set to for the axis, which is adjusted by this knob right here for swing, and then this knob right here for lift. And above both the gauges, you'll see this joystick icon, which is where I access the additional settings for the joystick, like smoothing, deadband, and then also inversion. Now, smoothing is the amount of time it takes for that axis to reach the maximum RPM or the maximum speed that it can achieve. Deadband is how much distance the joystick has to travel before it actually starts to send a motor command. And then underneath both smoothing and deadband, I have invert. And this just changes the direction that the axis moves based on the joystick input. And all of those joystick settings are found for lift 
as well. Now, this is a handy tool here where if I press this plus button, it expands the dashboard to increase the size of those position gauges for lift and swing. So after I'm done with all my configuration and I really want to just focus on the position of the arm, I can expand the dashboard and get a better view of where the arm is at around the vehicle or up and down. So underneath the dashboard, we have what's called the control panel. That's this area right here. And the control panel is where I do all of my configuration, my monitoring, my changing of settings, my calibrations for the arm. And underneath the control panel is the dock with all these icons that let me navigate between different control panels. So I'm just gonna go all the way to the left here and we're gonna start and go through all of the control panels and what each of them are used for. So the first one here is system info, and this is kind of like the odometer of the remote arm. This tells me what firmware versions are loaded onto each of the modules, and then it also gives us usage statistics for helping us understand kind of how you're using the arm more specifically. Now right next to it, I have my battery control panel, which is specific to Moto Crane Hyper and monitoring the dual 48 volt battery banks that are on board that arm. Now, I'm not connected to a Moto Crane Hyper right now, but if I were, this would tell me where each of those battery banks were at in terms of its charge status or its voltage. Now, next to the Hyper battery control panel, I have the UPC or Ultra Capacitor Power Core control panel. And this is what I use to monitor my UPC power accessory. Now, I had mentioned up here earlier this 99% um, energy storage bar, and that is the UPC. So as energy goes from the V-mounts into the UPC, it stores all of that energy internally. And that 99% is basically the indication of how charged my UPC is. And then this 49 volts is the actual voltage out from the UPC going into uh, my PSU. Now what's really handy about this control panel is I can actually monitor the individual charge level of the V-mount batteries that I'm using. So you can see as it's kind of you know trickle charging up and down here, you, you can see those levels kind of moving around a little bit. But for the most part, I have four fully charged batteries here, so I could continue to operate this system for hours before needing to change out those V-mounts. Now charge monitor here is just basically telling me how the system is charging. It's telling me what the input volts, which is really the, the total volts of my battery array down here, and what it's charging at, and then how much current it's drawing as it's charging, and then also the temperature of that whole charging circuit. Now from the output of the power core, I'm getting 49 volts, which is the same that I'm getting up here. So those two numbers are just mirrored. And then I actually have temperature monitoring for each of the capacitor core banks. So I have caps one and two, capacitors three and four, and capacitors five and six monitored individually. So in the event that you were to have a problem with the UPC and maybe one of the capacitors went bad, we would know by some kind of temperature indication there. So next to UPC, we have our INS control panel, which is where we do all of our tuning and monitoring for the active gyro stabilization for the arms. And just like a stabilized head, you can tune your INS based on the application. So whether or not your vehicle is using our suction cup grid or it's rigidly mounted to the vehicle or what stabilized head you're using, you can tune those parameters to get the most out of the system. And on the left hand side here I have the status of both the INS sensor and the gyro that's on board that sensor. And then underneath I have some gauges for monitoring the performance of INS. Now, next to my INS control panel, I have the limits control panel. And this is a very frequently accessed control panel uh, used to configure the range of motion that you're allowing the arm to be within. And this is one of the control panels that's been updated with a new feature in the new version 1.5 firmware update, and that is limits profiles. Previously, you would still see this configuration for both lift and swing access limits, but we've added limits profiles, which is the ability to store pre-configured profiles based on how you're using the arm. So for example, for profile A, you might have kind of your all around operating profile where you have a limit for lift, but no limit configured on swing because that's how you operate normally. But for B and C, you might have pre-configured profiles that maybe hold the arm to either the right or the left of the vehicle that allow you to go much higher and lower because of the additional counterweight clearance that's available at those angles. Now, limits configuration is really simple. And I wanna walk you through it really quickly. I'm gonna first just release my e-stop and I'm gonna go into configure for lift and say that I want that to be my lower limit. I'm gonna hit confirm and I'm gonna go to my upper limit. And then I'm gonna confirm that. Now it's just asking me to make sure that those two points that I just configured are in fact where I want my limits to be. And I'm gonna hit confirm. It's gonna let me know that the configuration was successful, meaning it stored that information to the system. 
And then it's also gonna ask me if I wanna turn those limits on right now at this moment. And yes, I do. So as soon as I did that, you'll notice up here on my dashboard, limits off, turn to limits on. I got this indication right here. And I'm gonna show you here in the dashboard, it's also given me this green region that indicates to me where I can go with my lift axis. So obviously within this green region, this is where I have my limits set to. So now I'm gonna configure my swing axis limits, which is the exact same process. I'm just gonna to go to configure. It's gonna prompt me to go to my clockwise position first. I'm gonna press confirm, and then move to my counterclockwise limit. And I'll confirm that. Now again, it's gonna have me confirm that those two points that I'm configuring are in fact where I want it to be. Hit confirm, it's gonna tell me that th that configuration was successful. Once again, asking me if I wanna turn the limits on right now. And there they are. And you'll see the same change happened again on my swing axis. And I'll expand the dashboard again so you can see that a little bit more clearly. So now I have that as my configured swing axis. Now what's great about limits profiles is I can just go from A to B and then pre-configure another profile that I can just jump to later on in the day. So when I change limits profiles, it's giving me this prompt that helps remind me that when I'm changing limits profiles, that I have to be aware of where those new ranges are so that I'm not accidentally driving it into some obstacle that I may not be aware of you know, when I'm transiting from one limits profile to the other. So now that I'm in B, you can see limits turned off again, and now I can configure a whole new profile. So now I have two limits profiles that I can hot swap between without having to reconfigure my limits based on how I'm using the arm throughout the day. So I'm gonna go from my limits profile B to A and show you what that looks like. Now you'll see that even though I changed my limits profile, which on swing went from this region down here to this upper right region down there, the arm isn't there yet. So I still need to move my arm from the previous limited region to the new limits region. Now, when I change my limits profiles from B to A, and the arm becomes outside of that new limits profile region, I can only drive the arm closer to that limits region, not further away. So you'll see that if I try to move the arm further away from this new swing region right here, I can't drive it away. I can only drive it closer. And then once I'm within that new limits profile region, I have full control to move within that new limits. So limits profiles is super helpful because you can store pre-configured ranges of motion based on how you're planning to use the arm throughout the day without having to stop and reconfigure those limits and also lose your previous configuration. The next control panel that we're gonna go into is mode, which allows me to configure how the two axes are controlled by the system. Because I'm connected to an ultra right now, you can see that both the lift and the swing axis automatically boot up in default mode. But because this unit is INS upgraded, this is where I would go to enable INS advanced stabilization and turn on that active gyro stabilization feature. Now you can also see underneath INS, I have two other features called limits protection and imbalance. And limits protection is essentially a correction made when the arm reaches a limit and the arm senses that there's some back driving force, either because of imbalance or wind or something, and it's gonna apply a corrective force to keep it from going beyond that limit. And then imbalance check is essentially the set of errors and warnings that come with that and whether or not you wanna be notified as a user or an operator of that correction taking place. Now, if you're a radical or a hyper user, this control panel is gonna look a little bit different. And at the top, you're gonna see setup, which is the mode that the system automatically boots up in because it assumes that you're setting up the system and that you haven't attached booms or payload yet. So moving the arm in this mode is really just applying a basic motor command. It's not applying any kind of correction or using any feedback. It's really just for positioning the arm during setup. But once you're done with setup, you can move into standard mode for both axes. And that brings the absolute encoders online for providing arm position feedback for configuring limits and then also for accurate and consistent arm moves when you're moving the arm in the presence of things like wind resistance or differing payloads. The next control panel that we're going to walk through is setup and this is where you do less frequent calibrations to the system like calibrating your joysticks or even the encoder angle. Now joystick calibration is used to make sure that your joystick is at a true zero point when it's neutral and encoder angle makes sure that the zero degrees of the encoder 
is actually calibrated to zero degrees on the arm. It can also be used more strategically if you're an operator sitting at a sideways angle within the vehicle to actually recalibrate the swing axis gauge to what is zero degrees for you versus zero degrees on the car, which makes operation a lot more intuitive. If you're a radical user, at the top of lift, you're gonna see balance test, which is a mode that we developed for radical that eliminates as much of the static friction as possible from the axis so that you can go from a coarsely balanced system, which is what's defined in the operation manual, to a very, very fine-tuned balance system. And that helps the lift axis perform at its absolute best. And at the bottom of lift, you're going to see standard mode tuning, which is more of an advanced tuning measure that you can take, which allows you to optimize standard mode for your particular setup. Particularly, more nuanced things like vehicle suspension, whether or not using the Ronin 2, the shot over G1, and even the particular rigging. You can optimize that tuning to make sure that you're getting the smoothest moves on the lift axis possible when you're in standard mode. Now, the last four control panels are all about monitoring the system. And the next one that we're going to look at is diagnostic. And diagnostic gives us a full numerical readout of all the critical metrics of the system, like motor and driver temperature. And next to it, we have status. And status is gonna display any current errors or warnings that have been detected by the system. You can see right now we have none. So I'm actually gonna go off screen for a second and create an error so you can see how it looks on the screen and then also how it goes away once the error has been remedied. So what I did was I disconnected the INS sensor that we're using, and that might actually simulate what could happen if someone accidentally disconnected the sensor without knowing that the system was turned off. And you'll see how right away when that happened, the controller alerted me immediately of some kind of cable disconnection and brought it to my attention. But as soon as I got the cable reconnected, it went away from status. And that's because the error was fixed. But in the event that I missed it, or I wanted to know what had happened with a little bit more detail, I can go to system log. And system log is the memory where all of the errors and warnings are stored so that they can be reviewed later. So you can see that there's a timestamp next to these two errors that occurred and a brief description of what happened, and then also some specific code numbers for me to reference. Now, the timestamp is really helpful because in the event that something happened while I was out shooting, I can kind of place it in time and say, okay, what were you doing one minute ago, or 20 minutes ago, or 30 minutes ago? Um, in the event that the system were to be powered off and turned back on again, you still have these stored in system log, but there's no longer a timestamp piece there. So you can see if it happened before you power cycle. Now, obviously INS error is not very descriptive and that's where these code numbers come in handy. And if I go to code lookup here, this gives me a full table of all of the errors and warnings so that I can know with more specificity what actually happened. So I'm gonna go to that 209 first, INS data invalid. And that's because I was actually moving the sensor physically and the system knows that for it to move like that, something must be wrong. Then the last one that I got was 223, INS heartbeat timeout. And that's actually the full disconnection from the system before I reconnected it. So it was actually that it was completely offline. Now I can hit this shortcut right here to go to system log. And if I've dealt with the issue and it's no longer relevant, I can just clear those codes by hitting the trash can right there. And now my system log is clear. So we're super stoked about the Command Console Pro and the Command Console Lite and the new features that are added with the version 1.5 firmware update, specifically compatibility with Moto Crane Ultra. If you guys have questions about either of these controllers or any of the features that you saw today, make sure you get in touch with us. And as always, be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.